Hello and welcome to the Car Care Now channel and welcome to the 2024 Toyota Tacoma. All new, redesigned from the ground up. And most folks who have been kind of following the Tacoma, many folks have voiced concerns. Well, the V6 is gone. We only have a four-cylinder turbo and kind of completely forgot about this truck and stuck to the old one. Folks, if you are one of those people, you are mistaken because Toyota really went out of their way and out of their very conservative nature to really take this truck to the next level and kind of future proof it for the next year as you'll find out in this video which we're going to start with a proper technical review we're going to take a look under the hood underneath the truck we're going to see everything that is new about it we're going to take a look at the outside the inside some things we like some things we do not like and ultimately we're going to share with you our thoughts if they did this update well or not right after this. Small disclaimer before we start the video, this particular SR5 Toyota Tacoma is a pre-production prototype and a very early one. Some of the final fit and finish will be different in the production model. So if you see something throughout the video that doesn't look right, is not fitting right, that potentially will be fixed in the final product. Let's start our technical review with the engine. So gone is the V6 and many will be upset and will miss the V6 and all that. But I have some news. We've been driving this car for some time. I don't miss the V6 in this particular model. I think they did this so well that if you've owned the V6 Tacoma and you go drive this, you're not going to miss it. Let's dive in and we'll talk about it some more. The Tacoma has many configurations of powertrains, but whichever configuration you have, you will have the same engine with a small twist. Let's dive in. So the engine in question is the T24A FTS. This is not a new and exclusive engine to this. We've seen this engine in multiple Lexus models. We've seen it in the Highlander, the Grand Highlander, and possibly many, many more models to come. Not an exclusive engine. It is a nice engine though in the Tacoma. It really fits well. So there is actually two versions of this engine in the Tacoma. There is the entry engine and then there is the core engine. So the entry engine makes less power. The core engine makes a little bit more power. And the cool thing is here, they're mechanically identical except the core engine has some software changes that improve its power output. And the core engine also has an oil cooler, which is really nice to have in, in a kind of a higher power engine. So mechanically though, both engines are exactly the same. So let's dive into their construction. Over at the top is a plastic valve cover of the nicer build quality category, not the cheapo ones that we've seen in some manufacturers. So far, folks, we've been using plastic valve covers with Toyota for a while. I haven't seen issues with them. This one seems exactly the same as like the 2GR FKS and some other models we've had, like the A25. There hasn't been issues so far. So, so far, so good. Now, on top of the valve cover, you do have the four coils, very accessible. There's no engine cover on this. Very accessible coils, very accessible spark plugs. But right next to that, unfortunately, this is the one thing with the T24 that I wish that was not the case. The direct injectors sit on the valve cover. So now removing the valve cover becomes kind of a hassle because you have to pull the injectors and then replace the seals and down the road, potentially they'll get stuck and it'll kind of add a giant complication. That's the only downside of having the injectors there, but performance wise and kind of efficiency wise, that's actually the better place for them because they're right next to the spark plug and things are better there than when they are on the side, like for example, the A25A. Now also sits on the valve cover is the high pressure fuel pump. Very interesting system here. It's actually an enhanced D4S. We'll talk about it in a little bit. Moving on from that to the cylinder head. Now this has a two piece cylinder head. There's the top part, which is called the cam cradle, cam carrier or cam tower. Either term is fine. It basically houses the camshafts and it's a separate piece than the bottom piece, which is the actual cylinder head that has the valves, the guys, the passages and everything in it. And there is a sealer in between them. Now, of course, this is a roller rocker and hydraulic lifter engine. 
that's something to be expected at this point in 2024. Now this engine of course is dual overhead cams with dual variable valve timing. Not electronic though, and that is the nice thing. There's no complication, they kept things simple. This is oil controlled. So the, the way this works is there's two little actuators right at the nose of the front cover, right where the cams are. Inside the cam, the bolt that holds the cam gear is actually the oil control valve. Now all this little solenoid or actuator does is it has a plunger that electronically comes out, pushes on that little valve, and that's how it actuates and changes the gear timing. Very cool design, very simple, so you don't have oil running all over the engine to make it to, to the OCV valves. They're right there and they're extremely simple and that's how you want it. Now the head gasket is a three layer steel head gasket, which is really nice and kind of a requirement of a turbo engine. The cylinder block is a two piece cylinder block. Let me explain how those two piece work because this may sound like something else. The block itself, and then there's a piece underneath it. And we'll talk about what that piece does. The block is all aluminum. It is a spiny or spiny liner. So this liner is not serviceable. It's basically the liner and then the block is cast around it. So you can't really remove it, service it, machine it, replace it. If it's damaged, the block is done. That's, this is something that Toyota has been doing for a very long time, successfully for the most part, unless the engines are neglected, then we have issues. Now, the cool thing with this engine is the crank is offset, is actually offset 10 millimeters. So the bores where the pistons go up and down are offset from the center of the crank. What that does is it puts less pressure as the piston is going up and down on the cylinder wall, which then increases fuel economy because there's less side load. And that is really cool that they did that here. Now we talked about the block being two pieces. Let me elaborate. So the end of the block, if you flip this block upside down, you put the crank, there's actually no caps that hold the crank in the main journals. So there's the second piece of the block that comes in and it contains the caps that hold the crank onto the block. They did this for better resistance of high, high revving, like continuous high RPM operation. And it just gives the entire engine more strength in that area than individual little caps. You have this giant kind of block that holds everything down. Doesn't add a lot of complication in service because it's basically another piece that comes off and then because the crank is not under pressure to pop out. The only thing is you do have to remove it to remove the rods so they can come out. That's the only addition to service wise, but it doesn't add a lot of complication. It actually keeps things very compact here. Now this engine does have two oil pans. There is the upper oil pan, which is all aluminum, and then the very lower oil pan, which is the tiny little pan. It is actually steel. Business as usual there, nothing have changed. Now this engine also has a balance shaft that is directly driven by the crank, gear to gear. There's no chain for that or anything additional. This is a design that Toyota have used for a long time without issues, as long as you don't run this engine low on oil. And then the oil pump here is pretty interesting. It's actually driven off of the balance shaft, also gear to gear. So it keeps things very compact. And I really like that. They just, the bottom of this engine is not huge because all this is combined into a very small space. And that is a nice thing. Now this engine has one timing chain, just goes from the cams to the crank. That's it, couple guides and an internal timing chain tensioner. And the front timing cover is actually a two piece timing cover. So you have a, a cover, then the chain and the guides and everything goes on, then another cover on the outside. And they did that for one particular reason, front timing cover leaks. So the area where the cylinder head meets the block, meets the front cover in the previous engines, that was a weak spot that always leaked. Here, you have kind of a void in that area because of this, that second timing cover in the back. It kind of creates like a, a jump on top of that area. So you actually don't have sealer there, which is pretty cool. So far, there's been a few leaks here and there from other areas because there's a lot of sealer to hold this thing. But we haven't had the infamous front timing cover leak from this style of front cover yet. Now, this engine has a vacuum pump because direct injected engines, we're going to talk about the fuel system here in a second. Direct injected engines don't create as much vacuum as normal port injected engines. So 
you have a vacuum pump that assists the brakes in the models that are equipped with a vacuum brake system and something very important for models that do not have a vacuum operated brake booster the turbo wastegate uses vacuum we're going to talk about that in a little bit as well but the only concern is the vacuum pump seems to have been put in a very non-mechanic friendly place they have done this in the past. It sits all the way in the back. Now, when this engine was put in the Highlander, it is right there because the back of the engine is right in front of you. But here in the Tacoma, it is in a very bad spot. Similar to the previous one, it's a very tight spot in the back. And should there be any issues with a vacuum pump, it's going to be a job and a half to get it. That's the only downside to that. But Let's hope they are reliable because there has been a few issues with vacuum pumps over the years now. Let's talk about the fuel system. So this uses an enhanced D4S system. What that means is you have four direct injectors and four port injectors. So you have kind of the best of both worlds. Folks, direct injectors, everybody seems to really dislike direct injectors for carbon buildup and all that stuff. There's actually benefits to them. That's how you get a small little engine like this that makes this much power and this good fuel economy because of direct injection. It's a precise method of fuel delivery that really works. The downside of that is you get carbon on the valves, but in this engine, you have both. And they can run either or and get you the because there are cases where port injection is actually more efficient but in this case you have both now the enhanced part they enhanced the injectors themselves the programming where it runs a lot better one thing that is gone is diesel mode if you guys owned a previous generation tacoma there was a mode where the injectors would go really loud and start cleaning so they wouldn't get carbon build up here and there this does not have that and that is the cool thing here so no more diesel mode for the tacoma this engine also has an oil level sensor something that toyota slowly since 2018 they've been slowly adding it to their engines very important sensor to have because let's reiterate one thing the oil pressure light is not an oil level usually unfortunately with the engines that burn oil that's usually the indication for the owners but here you have an actual oil level sensor which is very critical i think every engine should have one now the cooling system on this engine is somewhat simple but it does have one thing so you have a mechanical water pump at the front business as usual you have a coolant distribution valve this valve what it's going to do is it's going to block coolant for certain parts of the engine or the heater core to help you with faster warm-up and the most efficient operation possible for example you're in the middle of summer it's very hot why are we sending very hot coolant to the cabin and have all that heat inside now we're going to run the overrun the ac to cool the cabin they're not going to do that it's going to cut it that is the interesting part here it is simple but it adds so much in terms of faster warm-ups. Now, something very cool about this engine, in, in the Tacoma specifically, they added a lot of insulation here and there. They did not put really an engine cover on top, which is kind of interesting because that's the biggest insulation usually for the direct injectors, but other elsewhere, they added these foams in certain spots to keep, it, to keep the noise down. And you know what? Driving this engine, you can feel it. It feels quieter than that of the other models that have this engine. It's not as buzzy. It has a different sound to it. I mean, it's exactly the same engine as the one, for example, in the Highlander. But in the Highlander, it feels like a buzzy little four-cylinder. Here, it feels like a truck engine, like a good old, humble truck engine. That's the sound it makes. And it's just such a, a strange feeling when you know this is the exact same engine, but it sounds completely different in the Tacoma. And that is really a good thing and lastly but most importantly about the engine is the turbo this is a turbocharged engine it has a twin scroll turbo that is oil and coolant cooled and here is the interesting things unlike the other models that has this engine this has an air-to-air -air intercooler usually these are not the most efficient in the world and you do have a lot of ducting going to the front and back but that's what they went with but what that means is you do not have a second cooling system for this car so just the one system and that's all we have so there is a positive and there is a negative to it negative is you have more piping positive though everything is simpler more old school not as efficient 
But again, this is a truck for simplicity, not really high efficiency and kind of laser sharp technology. No, things need to remain simple. Speaking of simple, the wastegate. See, the biggest problem with the Tundra when it came out was the wastegates. There was an issue with their manufacturing and historically, wastegates that are electronically controlled will have issues in the, down the road. It's a little delicate actuator, electronic, that is in a, one of the hottest areas of the engine bay. Here we don't have that. We have very old school vacuum operated wastegate with a little actuator that turns on, turns off, and controls how much that wastegate open or closes. That is very cool. I mean, there is not much to go wrong. It's a mechanical part that will do well with heat, and then a little solenoid that activate that lets the vacuum pass or not pass, or pulse width modulate to kind of let some of it pass to partially open it. Worst case scenario, the little solenoid goes out, and it'll take you less than five minutes to replace it, and we're back on the road. That's so simple that this, and I love that they kept it this way. Now, let's talk about some final observations, and I've been looking through this. Now, we talked about the disclaimer. This is a pre-production prototype, so there are a few things that I see, actually, that are, don't feel like final production, so we're not going to mention that because these are not fair game. But let's talk about the things that are, and there's a few interesting things here. So, the biggest change from this to any Tacoma, since the Tacoma ever existed, there is no mechanical fan anymore. It's gone. Now, most people will be upset. There is nothing cooler than starting your Tacoma and the, and the engine roars to life, then it comes down. But it is such a cumbersome thing for service and it's such an old school thing that it's time to move on. And I don't understand why they didn't move away from it in the Tundra, but they did here and I'm happy with that. There is a very sophisticated high-end cooling fan that is electric, has the ECU sitting right there on top. It is a beautiful spectacle because it's a massive fan. We finally have gotten there with technology where we can mimic a giant mechanical fan with an electric one that actually works. They would not have put this here if it didn't work. It works and it works very well. And I welcome that change because dealing with mechanical fans for service, it's starting to get old. I just leave it at that. Other observations here is, which is something I am noticing with a lot of manufacturers, Toyota included, they're using more and more plastic components for cooling stuff. That historically have not been good. Now Toyota, I will admit this for to their credit, they do use high quality stuff, but still. We're not buying this to trade it in after 10 years. We're buying this to keep it for 25 years. Some of these plastics will be an issue. And I'm noticing some of them are in spots that are not easily accessible. And they are now using the quick disconnect stuff, which for cooling system is a disaster waiting to happen. And they did this in 2018 with some Camry models with the A25A. And then a few years later, they got rid of it. They came back to hose and clamp, which I love their lovely clamps that they use. They work so well. They literally last forever unless there is rust involved. I hope they do the same because I see a lot of those here and those are a concern. You basically take them out once, they'll never go back. They're brittle, they're break, and that's the end of that. Let's talk about the hybrid model, which now we have a hybrid model in the Tacoma. So the hybrid model is a one motor hybrid vehicle system or one MHV. That's the official designation for it. It is a parallel hybrid system and it is very similar to the operation of the Tundra hybrid. So same engine. The difference is in the transmission and what's, what's in the transmission area. So let me walk you through that in case you haven't seen the Tundra video that we've done on the hybrid. So there is a motor, one electric motor that sits between the engine and the transmission. That motor, MG, it's a motor generator. It has a clutch, a hydraulic clutch, and then that clutch is controlled by a little valve body that is separate from the transmission. The transmission that's connected to it is also an eight-speed transmission, an LF580F. It only comes in four-wheel drive configuration. It does not come in two-wheel drive. So the inverter, which now is called PCU, powertrain control unit, sits right where the 12-volt battery would be in the non-hybrid model. Now, the basic operation here 
here is the electric motor can drive the transmission and you're now in EV mode. And then it also can start the engine and then the engine can drive the transmission directly or they both can drive the transmission. It is not the highest of efficiency of hybrid systems. Like if you put an ECVT, but the reason they did that is this system is actually capable of towing because you have an actual eight speed transmission behind it. So it does make more power because now you have the same powerful engine and an electric motor behind it. It is very cool. The battery, the hybrid battery, is surprisingly a nickel metal hydride. They did not go with the lithium ion. They kind of wanted to go the safe route, old school battery technology, no lithium ion fussiness and whatnot. That, is, that was pretty interesting. The nominal voltage for this battery is 288 volts. It is 240 cells, 40 modules, very compact battery that sits right underneath the back seat with its own cooling system. It is air cooled, just like any other hybrid battery, which is not a plug-in hybrid. And that cooling system does have two fans. There are very quiet fans and they do take air from the cabin right underneath the back seat. On either side, there's actually a filter, which if you own one of these, you should leave that filter clean, unobstructed, and is a vital maintenance for the battery to to make sure it is a long lasting battery for you and you wouldn't have issues with this. We've driven the Tundra. We haven't driven an actual hybrid model on this, so I'm not gonna comment a lot of how that works with the four cylinder because the Tundra hybrid has a V6. But once we get one in the future, we're gonna kind of talk about it again to go over every single component, look underneath it, look around it. But I wanted to include it here so you know what's the deal with the hybrid system. Of course, the hybrid system does have a second cooling system for the inverter or the PCU. Let's talk about the transmission and the four wheel drive systems because there's a, this is where there's a lot of configurations of the Tacoma. Now, the transmission in the non-hybrid model is an eight speed transmission called the AL80. There's an E and an F, two wheel drive, four wheel drive. We'll get into that in a second. But the eight speed transmission is a very interesting transmission. It's a all new transmission for the Tacoma. It is a beautiful shifting transmission. If you drove a previous generation Tacoma, the six speed, while it was reliable, it was very clunky. It just hunts for gears and only has shift six gears, but it hunts for gears, shifts up, shifts down. They fixed all that here and they added two more gears. That is really nice. This transmission shifts extremely smoothly. I don't feel it hunting all, all over. It is very smooth. I feel it almost old school. You push the gas down a lot, it downshifts, you drive normally, it's not making up its mind what to do. It's just solid. And the best thing about it is it's super smooth. And in combination with this engine, it's, they, they work together very well. I am very impressed with this transmission. And the important thing about that you know about this transmission, the AL80 is essentially a UA80 modified and beefed up for the Tacoma. If in case you didn't know what the UA80 is, it is basically the eight-speed transmission that Toyota put in everything else, except it was a front-wheel drive configured transmission. In this, they took that same transmission, they modified it to become rear-wheel drive configuration, and then beefed it up a little bit because the Tacoma does tow. And there you have it. And then the biggest surprise, there is a manual transmission in the Tacoma. I am so happy for that one. It is a kind of an updated RC60 transmission and it has the next generation IMT, which is basically rev matching. I'm not into that rev matching stuff too much. I think I just like to do it on my own without I'm a little bit old school, but it is updated and supposedly better. We have not driven a manual transmission model. I'm just sharing with the technical specifications here. So. On the models with manual transmission, you only get the core engine or the higher output engine like this one, which I, I feel like that was intentional. If you're gonna get a manual, you're into cars and you're gonna want the more powerful version of the engine. Now let's talk about the four wheel drive configurations. First, there's a two wheel drive, very, very simple, not available in the hybrid models. They're usually available more on the lower trims, but it is an option should you not need four wheel drive, you just want to work truck, it is available and that is nice. Now the four wheel drive, and this is an, kind of an exclusive thing with the Tacoma, first, time, first ever, there's two four wheel drive options. You have 
the part-time four-wheel drive. Basically what that means is you have two-wheel drive mode, you have four high, and then you have low range. That is what you're used to if you've owned the Tacoma. You put it four high, the front and rear wheels are locked together, you make a sharp turn on drive pavement, it locks up and it severely puts a load on the powertrain. You should not do that actually. Now there is an option for a rear locker, so you can lock the rear differential just separately with a button, that is really nice. But the new configuration is, this is where things get really interesting with the Tacoma. They're trying to go the forerunner route. So you have full-time four-wheel drive. That is super cool. The way they did that is everything is exactly the same except the transfer case. So the front differential on this has a little actuator, ADD actuator, it is an automatic disconnecting front differential. If you are older, you remember four-wheel drive trucks, you had to go and manually unlock the hubs. Well, this does it automatically. They have been doing that for a long time now, nothing exclusive there, but I just wanted to cover this. The transfer case though, this is where the change is between the part-time and the full-time. So everything is the same with the low range and everything else, but you have a center differential that is a Torsen limited slip differential. So when you make turns and the front wheels and the rear wheels kind of change speed and you're turning, that center differential allows them to spin at different speeds. So now you can drive in that mode all day long and that's actually the only mode available. You can't put it in two wheel drive, just like a forerunner. But here's how that will work. You have four high free, or 4HF, four, four that is the mode where the center differential is working and when you take sharp turns even on drive pavement, it works because that's going to allow the speed differential between the front and back. Then there is the 4 high L or lock is going to actually lock that center differential and now it becomes exactly the same and if, if you have a part-time four-wheel drive in four high. The front and rear wheels are connected. You cannot make sharp turns and that's actually for off-roading. It is a mode you do need in off-roading. And then there's four low. Things are very simple and beautiful because one of the downsides of having a part-time four-wheel drive system for folks who are not really into off-roading but you drive in like snow, mud, gravel roads, they actually do not operate it properly. They put it in four high and they just drive all year long. You're actually harming your powertrain that way. You're not supposed to drive on dry pavement making sharp turns with the part-time four-wheel drive in four high. But when you have a full-time all-wheel drive, you're always an all-wheel drive. And that is a really nice option to have. If you're not really into off-roading, you just want a car that is, or a truck that is always in four-wheel drive, well, now you have the option to do that in the Tacoma which is super cool. Let's take a look underneath the 2024 Toyota Tacoma, starting with the biggest elephant in the room. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And uh, this is a very strange decision to have this, but the good news is I'm noticing that there is a series of bolts here and I think two bolts here, two bolts there, and this thing comes off. So I think that will be, for some at least, myself included, this will be the first thing that gets taken off when we buy the truck new. Moving on, cool things. Remember the Tundra when it came out, it had no front hooks. This one does, and that's why they have this big opening. There's one here, and there is another one here, although it's very small, but there is a hook, and that is very cool. Something that, kind of departed from the Tacoma. So all previous Tacomas had a metal shield similar to the Tundra previous generation. This one, the off-road models, you're gonna have it, but here, this is just the fabric. Good and bad, good, great for service. Bad that you don't have as much protection. But one thing have to be said, you notice everything is flat. You don't have stuff st sticking out. So at least there is that. Let's start with the front suspension because we have a lot to talk about here. The biggest change in the Tacoma and something that is so welcome, you, you guys will love it if you own a Tacoma. If we turn around and look here, this 
is an electric rack and pinion. If you come around here and look right there, that is the motor that actually operates this rack and pinion. Folks, this is a huge deal because if you've owned the previous generation Tacoma, you know that the racks leak, you know that the lines eventually will get rusted and leak, and then there's one more fluid to maintain, and historically, electric racks, there hasn't been any issues. So this is a really big deal and a huge improvement right here. Let's look at the front suspension here. The lower control arm, it got updated, it looks different, but it is a similar style, of course, this is a double wishbone. You notice that the shock mounts in a different spot. It used to mount more up top of the control arm. Now it mounts a little bit to the side, which is nice. The ball joint, unfortunately, is still part of the control arm. I wish they would change that, but you still have the disconnect from the knuckle here, which is really nice. Now, the calipers are still dual piston calipers. They are updated. They are offset pistons to help it last longer and not vibrate. Time will tell because something also common with the Tacomas, these love to seize up over time. I hope that is something that they improved because this is kind of over, long overdue and it's, all Tacomas do this with this style caliper. But the knuckle is aluminum and the wheel bearing is a bolt-on, still a bolt-on wheel bearing, but it's a completely different style. This is kind of the new direction they're headed. The only issue with that is for longevity. Again, we're not talking about any other car. This is the Tacoma. You buy it to have it for a long time. Eventually, the wheel bearing will, because of dissimilar metals with aluminum, it literally weld itself. Look up Priuses, second gen and third gen. It's the same thing, especially second gen Prius. But they did that for weight. And you notice this aluminum knuckle goes all the way to the top to a very familiar upper control arm that is the wishbone part of the top. Now the shocks, there is a lot of shock options here. So this is the kind of the standard lower trim shock, nothing special about it. This one is by Toyota. It says Hitachi, that's something we've seen before, same brands. There is a trim that comes with Bilstein shocks. That was kind of more higher trims. And then you get into the TRD Pro, which still have Fox shocks, but now they are adjustable. You have a little knob literally on the shock to adjust the kind of the, the firmness of the ride. Same thing in the back. And then on the Trail Hunter, which is a new trim that they're adding here, you got Old Man Emu, possibly one of the most high-end shocks for any Tacoma or off-road truck you can get. They have a new technology in them. I am not into Old Man Emu, so I don't know the exact details of what that technology is, but they have some strange dampening technology, which is pretty cool. But I like that they give you a lot of options for suspensions from the factory. Now, moving on from the suspension to the front differential, I noticed a few things that changed, and, and I, I like the changes. The differential itself is still cast iron, and that is really good. But the part, the kind of the tail shaft piece and where the actuator hooks onto it is aluminum. In my opinion, they did this for weight. This is, I mean, aluminum is a lot lighter than cast iron but they didn't compromise on the housing kind of strength. They put the cast iron part where the load is gonna be. This does absolutely nothing. There's just a shaft that goes through, but this is where the load is gonna be. And I love that they did that. I noticed that they changed some of the mounting points of the differential, but other than that, they didn't do a lot more. And one of the hallmark things with Toyota, that is a steel oil pan with a 14 millimeter drain plug, huge deal. A lot of manufacturers will put, some of them are putting plastic, some of them are putting aluminum where they have been, but Toyota always stuck with the steel oil pan, that's a huge deal. But something you notice, we talked about the engine, we said that it has a lot of insulation. This is one of those covers for noise. I love that they're trying to do this because it really shows this engine is, it should be loud, but it's not as loud because of little insulators like that. The sway bar, is pretty interesting. See, in this one, it's just a standard sway bar. There's nothing special about it. Very large. I mean, this is probably one of the largest ones we've seen. Very interesting bushings. Only concern about this is with rust, is these will rust, but they did do something with this that I love. Do you see how this bracket at the top is actually bolted to the frame? It is not welded. Now, on the other side, it goes straight into the frame, which is 
fine. I mean, we have no other choice here. But I love that this bracket is not welded to the frame. Should 20 years from now this rots off and, and corrodes and breaks, you can just replace the bracket. You don't have to be welding at the frame and doing all that. And that is really a huge deal. Moving on from that to the transmission. Talked about this transmission being a reconfigured eight-speed direct shift transmission. This is how that looks like. I love that there is good access around it. I love that it, it's very compact and small. There's nothing really big gimmicks about it. Single plug on this transmission. This is, of course, a dipstickless or sealed transmission. So this is where you're gonna drain the fluid. There's a stand pipe here, and you're gonna check the fluid level from the same plug. You notice the shift cable. Again, this is old school. We never change this, the important stuff. Shift cable on this side, neutral safety switch on the other side. Similar kind of to the Forerunner is like that. Forerunners did have issues with because of this style with the neutral safety switch. We're hoping we don't have any issues here. Transfer case. We talked about there's two, two styles transfer case. This is the part-time transfer case. The only thing I wish they would have changed, and I really don't 100% quote me on this, but from what I'm seeing here, unless the hybrid model is different or the or the full-time four-wheel drive, four drive model is different, unfortunately, this actuator, if it goes, you still have to tear into this, this transfer case completely, unlike the Tundra where they changed it. That's one thing that I wish they would have changed. But the main thing is, if you don't want this actuator, same thing on the previous ones, every month actuate it, move it so it wouldn't get seized. And same thing with the front differential that does have the ADD actuator. It's an automatically disconnecting front differential, which is nice. Now, the biggest thing to me, we always have problems with frames, with old Tacomas and rust. You notice the biggest change is this is no longer a C frame. This is actually a fully boxed in frame. And I love that because notably, even, even though some older forerunners could have issues with rust, but they're significantly less than the Tacoma. And that's because of their fully boxed in frame and they did that. But additionally, they did some small stuff that is, I think is gonna make a huge impact. You notice everything is covered. All the openings are covered. The most important one that is covered is where the body mount is in the front. There's this cavity that loves to hold all kinds of salt and stuff here. It is covered. Yes, it does have a little opening to drain anything that goes inside. But overall, it is better covered and kind of has a funnel to drain everything out and not have issues. I, I see that they are seriously trying to do to fix the issues of the previous generation and that is a huge deal now the exhaust really standard it comes from this side it wraps around usually that is not the case and the reason for that is we finally do not have a fuel tank on this side on the tacoma for some reason now it lives here and it is probably the toyota's second longest fuel tank after the tundra it is massive and it goes all the way here. It is not really a huge fuel tank, but it's so narrow that they had to make it super long. It does have three straps, and that is, fortunately with rust, these will eventually rust out, and now you have three, not two. But I noticed this very interesting bracket. I want to say that this bracket only supports it. It's actually not part of it, because this is resin or plastic, and this is not, this is metal. So there's this extra brace here that supports the fuel tank, which is pretty cool. The drive shaft, we got some changes here. So on the models with the shorter beds, you no longer have a center support bearing. Again, Tacomas with drive shafts, they did have some issues, but I noticed a change. This is where you see the really improving things. This is an aluminum single piece drive shaft. And the U-joints, I'm trying to look at them here, they are sealed. Yep, they are sealed. That's unfortunately still the case. We lost the greasable U-joints with the previous generation, and it is still the same here. Same here, no grease, and that's okay. I hope the sealed ones hold better. We haven't had a lot of issues so far with the previous generation with the sealed ones. But the models that have a longer bed or the off-road models will have a skinnier drive shaft with a center support bearing just to give it extra rigidity. But 
That's all you need. Something interesting here. The manufacturer of this rear of this drive shaft is Dana. Interesting. This is actually a good company that makes drive shafts. So this is a nice drive shaft. It's actually very lightweight, and they're trying to do all this stuff just to make things better. Now we move back to a very familiar site. The uh, rear differential. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. They still use the design where the carrier drops into the housing, not the other way around. This is a great design, and we never had issues with this, and they never changed it, and I don't think we're ever going to have issues with it again. Now, the vent is here. This is an SR model that we're looking at, prototype here. The vent is here. I will wait to see if the off-road models will have an extension that takes the vent up because that would be really nice. It's a small detail. But you notice uh, small blast from the past. Is this leaf springs on a just remodeled car? Yes. This is the surprise. So the very base trim or the base model will still have leaf springs in the back. Folks, there's nothing wrong with leaf springs. Although there's one concern here we'll talk about. There's nothing wrong with leaf springs. They are, however, not the most comfortable and the most, you know, user friendly. They're, they're like a truck, truck suspension. They're rough, they make bounciness, and they're not the smoothest in the world, but they are heavier duty. Now, anything over the base model, you're gonna have coil springs. So the truck will ride better, it's nicer, Possibly not as heavy duty, but again, you're not going to be towing and really hauling extreme loads on the Tacoma. It's not really meant for that. But the, the concern is here that I'm seeing, because we've, in the two generations ago with the Tacoma, we did have some issues with leaf springs. I'm noticing there is no clamps and there's only three leaves. I can understand why they didn't go with a heavy duty leaf spring here, because this is the base model. I mean, it's not, again, it's not a three quarter ton truck. So I understand why they didn't do that, but that is something I'm gonna, I would keep an eye on because with rust and load and everything, this is all that's holding the leaves, this and the shackle and U-bolts and one over there. Usually we had five on, at some point. We don't have that anymore. Then we look at the rear brakes, huge change. This will make some folks happy, some folks not very happy. Now we have disc brakes on all Tacomas, all trims will have disc brakes and electronic parking brake integrated, which is really a good idea. Previously, we used to have basically drum brakes in the back and that was the parking brake as well. I love this, this is very simple. It's much better than like how the Forerunner is with the parking brake in the middle and all the problems that they have. This is a lot simpler and a lot better. Then we look at this. I love this, this spare tire, but now we have a small spare tire. I wonder if all the models have this. We haven't looked at every single model yet, but this is actually a space saver. I wish they would have put a full-size spare tire. That would be really nice. They didn't, and that's okay. But I'm noticing here that the tow hitch is actually part of the frame. If you look at it right here, it is part of the frame. That is great for strength. Not great if you hit this, you basically damage the frame, technically, because this is not separate from the frame. I wish that would have been something that was, at some point, repairable, detachable, but then it affects the strength. So there's kind of that delicate balance. The exhaust, interestingly, and this is, we skipped over that a little bit, let me go back to it. For a four-cylinder engine with a turbo, this is a pretty large diameter exhaust pipe, and that is pretty interesting. And then we go back here, it comes to a really big tailpiece here. Very interesting stuff. The charcoal canister is right here, which is a really good spot. And from just looking at it, this is the latest generation charcoal canisters. You will not see this in the previous gen. This is kind of the updated one, which I like to see. It's like in a good spot, you just drop the spare tire, it's right there. The fuel tank is so far away, and this entire area is wide open. That was a hallmark of the Tacoma and it's still here. Look how wide open the space is. There's no complication. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why put all complicated stuff here? The brake lines, however, we still have the same thing. And I understand why they do it, but I wish they would do something. Look at this line. It is coated. It has this heavy coating on it. Then you come here, the coating stops right here 
and then this part is exposed. Anything that rocks, stuff that hit that line is going to start corroding, and then we have issues. I wish they would have... I understand why they do this, because you need that space to move this when you install it, but I wish they would have gotten it a little closer, a little bit of coating on it. That would be really nice. If you own one of these and you live in the Rust Belt, that would be the first thing you should do is coat these ends, because it's the same thing when you get to the flexible hose, same thing everywhere, basically. Now, this is a truck, and we're not going to go too hard on them, but again, this is open, just like everybody else. We have to be fair to everybody and to Toyota. They are wide open, and I wish they would cover them up a little bit better, especially like from standing here, you can see all the way to the top, and that's, wish they would cover them up a little bit. And basically the fender liner is just sitting here, nothing is holding it. But there's a big change, which is small, but very important. If you really own a previous generation Tacoma, you'll understand why this is a big deal. The wheels, still six lugs, which is really nice, but we no longer have the weird cap that sits here. This is just a regular center cap. Very hard to steal, because that was the problem with these. Very hard to steal, and I just it makes it look cleaner. Usually these caps, they never sit right, and they, they fall and all that. This is just a regular center cap, which works really well. I cannot comment on the other models. They're exactly the same, but at least in this one that we have, this is the cap you want. There's one thing that is very interesting, and I hope it is just a prototype thing. So this is the body mount. This is where the body connects to the frame. I don't know why this stud is this long. Possibly for manufacturing. So when, you, when they lower the body on the frame, it will be easier to line it up. That's the only reason I can think of it, but it's, it completely sticks out and you see it. Almost looks like a bolt that is not tightened. But then the theory of it being to make the body lining up easier doesn't make sense because if we go all the way to the front, it's going to be a little more difficult to see it. But if you look all the way up here, you see the other one. It, uh, like right there, you see it. You don't see the same thing sticking out. And that is, uh, yeah, that's interesting. But that's, that's what they decided to go with here. But the last thing I want to talk about here. Sorry, sorry, we kind of skipped over that. The body and the sealer. I like that they did not start following some of the trends that we're seeing in the automotive industry. Look how beautiful this seam application is. Folks, this is a prototype. If this seam application was terrible, I would understand. This is not the final product here. But look how beautiful it is on a prototype. That it doesn't matter if it is perfect or not. This will never be sold to a customer. And then you come look here. Same thing, a little bit, things get a little interesting here, but still, this is a very thick, high quality coating that cover everything. And they leave these areas for, in case there's something that goes here, so it would drain out and not stay there. And then they still do this. They still put all the bolts where your accessory sidestep would go. This is where you would bolt them. See, at some point, they used to leave these open and they would corrode and look horrible and they started putting bolts and I'm glad they still do that. They still put the bolts and leave them there so the, the opening is not, not just wide open and starts corroding everything. I like that. They are still thinking of longevity with this truck, not just let's make the latest and the greatest and just push it out. There's a lot of little stuff here that they don't have to do, but they do it for this truck to last a long time, and that is really welcome. Well, let's take a look at the outside of the 24 Tacoma. And folks, previously, the previous Tacoma, it looked like a truck, had kind of a mean look. But this, even as not a truck, it's a good looking car. I have to say that. This is a really nice design. And this is not even the high trim, this is just one of the, actually the lower trims here, the SR5, and it just looks beautiful. I, I really think they did a really good job. And let's talk about some of the key things that they did here. First thing is the headlight. It is small. It is not an oversized headlight, but it just looks very masculine and aggressive. And it just it gives it a very interesting look. And then this little black trim underneath it, even though it does absolutely nothing, it's just the design. But it emphasizes this shape. 
That little black piece really emphasizes the grill area. The grill is not oversized top to bottom. It just, everything looks right about it. Let's get into the small technical details though, because there is a few interesting choices here. First thing is, this is an emblem. There is no radar sensor. You notice it's wide open. This is not the radar sensor. The radar sensor moved here. Not the best idea on the planet. I have to say that because this is too low and anything hits it, you hit the bumper a little bit, it's immediately there. I wish it was still here. But I can also understand why they did it that way, because you have multiple trims, some of them are higher, and if you put it here now, it's too high, potentially. That's just my humble opinion here, so that's why they put it here. The very interesting thing is, they put a little, one of these, some of these very fine writing here, it says, do not paint, because that is a radar sensor, you, per, you paint it, it's no longer going to work, because that's a special piece of plastic in front of it. But then the fog lights are here, so it gives us a very interesting look when they're on. I really like how that looks like. And you notice this is an SR5. This is one of the, kind of the lower, not the lowest trim, but the lower trim. You have parking sensors. And I love that these are black and this one is body color. So we can make things they care about the look, not just throw everything and let's go. Now, there is one thing I dislike about this front and I think it's the biggest elephant in the room which we have to discuss and get past. What happened when we went down there? Can you please e elaborate, Toyota? What happened there? Why is that enormous? Now, here's my two things that I'm going to say about that. That it looks to me like a compliance thing. Or we wanted to get that last 0.3 miles per gallon to get it the next certification so we added that and then we put it so easily removable and doesn't even make anything different so yeah you can remove that because if you look here the bumper is actually finished all the way to that point so i feel like the engineers are trying to tell you we have to put that but you're welcome to remove it so hint hint there because my biggest concern with that is this giant truck that is 4x4, four four, has this much ground clearance. I'm sorry, I think my 22 Camry Hybrid has very similar ground clearance in the front. That's not good for a truck, but the good thing is you can remove that. But the one thing I have to say, the off-road trims do not have that, because they have different fascia. They do not have that, so there is that for you. Let's look at the hood, because there's something very interesting about the hood. This panel that bulges up on both sides and it dips down and then comes back but this is definitely higher than the rest gives it a very muscular look and then when you look at it from inside you see these bulges up it just gives it a very nice character i really i really like how this truck looks they really did a good job here and then we come over to the side you have this little aerodynamic flap right here that is wide open you can see through it that is pretty interesting. They're really trying to make this as aerodynamic as possible, being a giant box going down the street. The fender arches in this particular model are body color. I think they look really nice. And they did this thing with the fender. So the fender comes down and then dips down and then goes back up. It's actually, it is raised a little bit, but this gives it the impression that it's a lot wider than it is. Then we look at the side, very familiar side. Tacoma right here, little line right here, and that line comes back down here. There is not much else going on here. And that is the cool part. However, there is one thing. We said this panel is a little bit raised to give it a wider stance. That actually comes down here and gives this door very interesting profile in this area. It's very difficult to show it on camera potentially. When you see it in person, it's a very interesting panel how it looks. Mirrors are very large. And I really like that. They didn't make it tiny to be, no, they're huge mirrors and that's pretty cool. Then we look at the finer details. This particular model has a smart key. Very simple, except that smart key looks like this. It is almost, it makes me, question that Toyota is actually doing stuff like this, one of the most conservative companies. So 
this is a credit card. Oh, you can get a key for this normal, but this is basically a credit card size key. You can put it in your wallet, you don't have to worry about the key. The only downside with that is there's no buttons. So you have to actually lock it to the door and walk away. That's the only downside. But initially when I was handed this key, I thought, okay, this is a giant gimmick. We're not talking about some hot car that's gonna break down after five years. This is a car you can keep for a long time. This will get in the way. But after, we've been driving this car for almost eight days here now. I got used to it and I think it's a good idea. Other than uh, if you lose your wallet, you lost your keys too. I, I can live with this. I see where they're going with this. Then, this is of course the two-door configuration, there's no rear seats, we'll look at the interior in a little bit. But there's a little bit of uh, detail here that I love. This ends here, and then this part is painted red and the rest is black. They could have left this black and not painted, nobody would have complained. But I love that they paid attention to these little details to make this line continuous. That is really nice. And then you have this little subtle line here. And then this is my favorite part. The way this sticks out like a spoiler. It just looks, it gives it a very dramatic look that I really like. This truck is really a looker. And when I saw it in person the first time, you see pictures and all that, yeah, okay. But when you see it in person, it has such a character and that's the whole point of a Tacoma. That's the cool thing about them. This thing looks super cool. Now, what's not super cool is this. They still do that, unfortunately. I wish they would change it, or at least, Toyota, if you're watching, folks don't all live in a nice place. People still pour ga sugar here and steal your gas and all that. A locking one would be nice, at least as an option for those that need it. Or uh, it would be really nice if this was you open it from the inside, now just anybody can walk up to your car, but they still go with this and that's how it is. Going back to the side here, these tail lights are very close to how the Tundra look, but I think they look better here. I, I'm really impressed by how this car looks, folks. This is, looks are uh, to each their own, but to me this looks really good. And this matches the sh overall shape and then there's this little curve here that comes out. I really like this. And of course, Tacoma, is, this is something they've been doing for a minute now. Tacoma is stamped on the bed as usual. And I love that there's no 4x4, 2.4, turbo, no, no, there's no badges. It barely says Toyota here, it doesn't even have the Toyota logo. Tacoma 4x4, that's all you need to know. And that's about it. The bed. The camera is right here for the, for the backup camera, which is actually a good spot for it, not super low. And the bed is a soft open bed, which is pretty nice. Now some of the panels you're going to look at here, they have a strange appearance. Remember this is a pre-production prototype, so I don't feel like these are final panels. The bed. I like that it is, it kind of has a liner to it, but this is not an optional liner. And the reason for that is, these are the bolts that mount the bed to the frame. They are exactly the same as the first Tacoma you ever laid your eyes on, and they're still here exactly the same. We, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's the theme they went for here. And even for this kind of lower trim model here, you have these nice LED lights, which is really, really, I mean, they really illuminate at night, and that is really cool. And I'm noticing something here. The wheel arches don't stick out as much. They figured out a way to kind of integrate them in where they're not sticking out too much into the bed. This is available in a power option. Now, honestly, there is good features and then there's gimmicks. I feel like that is one of the biggest gimmicks there is because if you own a truck, and you're gonna put stuff here and haul stuff. I hope you can do this. But no, there is a power option where this comes down and then you press a button and the thing comes up and closes. I feel like that is on the gimmicky side a little bit, especially when you think this is a truck. But it is available as an option which adds mega complication because over here there will be an actuator motor that 
pulls the door back and it's a little bit in a complicated fashion and if you do not know how these soft doors open there's actually two shocks inside the door just like any hood shocks or back door shocks like in a forerunner there are two shocks here that's how this thing opens softly but I just feel like a power door here is too complicated and then when you want to open the door you have to go through the manual release to release the lock and then it just adds too much complication for nothing the other thing that they have as an option they have lights that go somewhere here on the bed you can kind of see the imprint of them this of course doesn't have them I guess they they are for overlanding so you can light the side of the truck so you can see I guess that works I wish it was available as an option in all model or as an accessory since we were just replacing this and adding a few things but that is also available as an option and the last option which is super cool in the hybrid model there is a 2400 watt inverter and a power outlet in the bed and inside the truck which is very cool to see I wish it was also available in other models because I mean who's gonna buy the base model I'll tell you who's gonna buy the base model a contractor that doesn't need to be driving a giant truck they're gonna need that so I wish it was available in lower trims that are not hybrid but that can be easily changed well, let's take a look of the inside of the 2024 Toyota Tacoma. And there's one thing I have to say here. This is possibly, I, I keep saying this, I love this interior. Not because it is fancy and over the top and all, the exact opposite of that. This is a Tacoma. It is a truck. It needs to stay simple. It is not a luxury car. And that's exactly what they did here and they did it very well. See, you look at this, it is visually pleasing to look at. You do have the Tacoma written over there. Proper vents, not some strange vents that you can't access. Gauge is clear, seating position is good. You sit pretty high and proper shifter here. Few odds and ends we're, we're gonna talk about here. Things are basic and it takes you no more than five minutes to be familiar with everything from the door handle to the start button to the HVAC controls to everything. And that is very important. Let's start with the steering wheel, which is, for lack of a better word, the exact same steering wheel from the Tundra. It works in the Tundra, it works here, slightly on the bigger size of considering the size of this interior, but I love it. It works, it's very easy to operate, and it's very clear. The gauges, in this particular SR5 model, you just have a big gauge, big screen in the middle, two gauges on the side, things are very simple. Some customizations, but nothing over the top because that is not a full, full screen. You look in the middle here, you have an infotainment system, that is the latest infotainment system, a little bit glitchy, and although this particular one that we are testing seems a lot better. I feel like they've come up with an update, and this one is the latest update one, and it worked actually pretty good for us in our testing. In the middle, you have automatic climate control in this particular SR5. Very big dials. Very simple to operate. There is nothing in the screen. Everything is physical. And I love these little toggles. They just, they look very nice and they're very satisfying to operate. Just like the Tundra, the wireless charger makes your phone stand up so you can actually see it while it is in the charging port. Very nice actual cable shifter, not a fake shifter. It just looks proper, feels right. I love it. And now this truck, of course, just like we looked at when we looked underneath it, does have an electronic parking brake. So you have that right here. The 4x4 controls are right here. You have a button on the side and you turn it very simple to operate and it's right in front of you i feel like this is like the most important thing they kept it very close to the driver and focused the one thing i will say the center console area here is a little bit on the smaller side i wish it was a little bit bigger you do have some storage on top of the dash you have double storage on the door which is really nice and things are extremely focused there is a lot of little stuff that make a huge impact. For example, you have this grab handle right here, but underneath that grab handle, you have a little hook. If you have a bag, something you want to hang, you actually have a place to hang it from. And the materials here are not cutting edge materials. No, everything's plastic, but that's exactly what you need in a truck like this. We don't need fancy stuff and that's gonna even take this price even higher. 
But the best part is, this is a pre-production prototype, so I don't expect the fit to finish. I mean, there are some panels that are not final panels here. But even with that, things are fine. Nothing rattles, nothing... Everything works, even though it's all plastic. And I like that. They did not lose focus of what this is. And this is something I'm seeing with a lot of trucks. Unfortunately, the Tundra slightly went into that because this needs to function like a truck first, then the higher trims come later to make it nicer if you want it. But in the basic form, this is everything you want from a basic, humble, smaller truck. Does it very, very well. There are a thing or two that are I wish they would have done it a little better. The seats, though this has the manual seats, they are not the most comfortable seats in the planet. And that historically have been the case with the Tacomas with their manual seats. The only thing I notice here that is nice, even though this is a manual seat, this, is, this does have an optional lumbar support that is electric. That is really nice. Because before, if you get manual seats in the base model or the lower models, you're kind of stuck with no lumbar support. Here, you do have that option, which is very nice. Now, the other thing is, in this particular one, you only have two doors, two seats, nothing in the back. I wish they would have put some temporary seats or something simple, but here's what they did instead, which I think more than makes up for it. For example, we look at this seat. You can first fold it all the way down. I mean, think of this. This is a work truck in this particular trim. You're gonna buy this as a work truck, Look at this. The back of the seat have this very heavy material. You can put your tools here, you can put your stuff. You're using this as a work truck. You have these little hooks where you can put a little webbing here or anything that fits your needs. This is good stuff. And then in the back, you have multiple storage areas. You have this big lockable door. They really thought this out well, and I love that. And the interesting thing is, this particular truck does not have like an opening back window to the side, but that is still available as an option in the higher trim, which is really nice. I love this, what they did in the back here. Yes, you don't have a seat where you can actually sit somebody, even though it's not comfortable, but at least something. But you do have all this storage. I feel like this particular trim is really aimed at being a work truck and a proper one and one that will not disappoint you that drives great and still have all this functionality i really think they did this really well let's talk about some things i do not like about the toyota tacoma and i have a confession to make i almost did not do this section because i love this truck and i think they really did a good job however we have to be fair and honest here. Nothing is perfect in life. It's an imperfect machine made by imperfect human beings, so we have to be fair. There's a very few things, and they're very minor about this truck that I dislike. Biggest one is that giant balance. It kind of negates the point of this, of this, especially when you get it in four-wheel drive configuration. It makes the ground clearance in the front so low. I wish they would do something about it. Or if you bought one, you really dislike it like I do, you can remove it. There are a few bolts. But again, it could have done something. We don't want to be removing parts out of a new truck as soon as we get it because it looks hideous. The other thing is, and this is not against the Tacoma itself, it's an automotive industry wide. The prices have, have uh, they boiled up is the best way I'm gonna describe it. I mean, prices start at 31,000 and something with destination, with everything is gonna be closer to 32, 33. So that is a lot for a base model truck. And then you add four wheel drive and you add any kind of option, you're almost at 40. That's the problem. And then the higher trims, they get very expensive, but the higher trims is the higher trims. If you just want a basic truck that has no gimmicks, no options, just stripped out down model with four wheel drive, you're looking to pay close to upper 30s into the 40s with destination, with taxes and everything. That is a bit much. And that's not just the Tacoma, that's every new car, but this one included. So should you buy a 2024 Toyota Tacoma? Folks, the truth have to be said, Toyota did this one really well. I mean, the update on this truck 
is spot on. They did a, such a great job. And let me share with you some of my thoughts on why that is. See, I was one of those people that dislike when they drop the V6 going into a four-cylinder turbo that is a high-strung engine, feels like it's on its last leg on day one. But the truth of the matter here is they put the four-cylinder, which by the way, is not new or exclusive to this. It's actually in a lot of other models, which is a typical Toyota trait. They do this all the time. And then when you listen to this engine, how it sounds, it sounds to me like an old 2TR FV engine, the old four-cylinder from the Tacoma. And I feel like that was intentional. When you listen to this engine, it sounds like, oh, here's this cute little four-cylinder that has absolutely no power. You push it, does makes a little bit of noise, not really that loud. You drive and then you look down, you're way above the speed limit because this truck will creep from underneath you and go very fast. It's not the fast, hot truck, of course. It's a very capable engine. And they managed to put a very good transmission behind it. This eight speed feels wonderful. And this combination, I think makes up for the V6. Folks, this is truly impressive how they are able to get this much power out of this engine without making it feel high strung or feel like it's on its last leg and have this beautiful eight speed that shifts very nicely. This truck does not feel like it needs a V6 and that is credit to Toyota for doing this. That is a huge plus. Now there is another thing that I love about this Tacoma. You know, I know the Tacoma buyer because they come to my shop and I talk to them. They are simple, sensible, focused people. They don't like gimmicks. They like a first and good truck. This is not over the top. Even though you look at it, it looks the definition of over the top, but it's not. Everything inside is focused. There's no gimmicks. All the physical controls are physical. The shifter is a proper cable shifter. You can even still get it with a leaf spring suspension in the back if you sh so you need to. There's no gimmicks. If you want the gimmicks, you have to go up in the trim. But if you want just a sensible, basic truck, you can still get that. You can even get it in a manual transmission if you want it, which is a huge deal. And the best part is, even though this particular one is a pre-production prototype and we cannot completely come down at them for fit and finish and final build quality, it is truly impressive. We're not talking about high-end materials. This is a truck. This is not a luxury car. But the fit and finish here and the little details and the little updates from, to fix the things from the previous generation are truly impressive. And it goes with the kind of image of Toyota of reliability. I love that. And that is very important. Now, nothing is perfect in life. Of course, there is gonna be downside and let's address a few last ones. The biggest thing is, it's gotten a little expensive. I mean, you option it a little bit with some slight features. You go up one trim, you're into the $40,000 range. Like this one right here, if it was the production car, this would be priced right around 42,000, which is a lot of money because the higher trims will be extremely expensive. That's the only problem, but in their defense, I will say the truth. All new cars are getting extremely expensive, so that's kind of the norm. And the other thing is the uh, big elephant in the room. The giant dam in the front absolutely makes no sense, but the good thing is you can remove it. So hint, hint, if that's the only thing stopping you from buying this, it's a few bolts, five minutes of your precious time, and it's gone and gone for good. So that's the good part. Folks, they really did this well. If you are holding off for one of these trucks for the sake of not having a V6, I don't think you'll be disappointed. And if you really are worried about that, go with the model with the core engine. This particular one does have the core engine. I love how it drives. It has adequate power, have adequate torque. This is not the truck you're gonna be pulling a fifth wheel in your giant boat behind it, but you will be towing with it, and I think it will be capable. And they've done every, there's so many little updates here that many will not notice, and I hope after this video you notice them, that make this a better truck than the previous generation. Then that is rare these days. When they update cars, you always feel like they went backwards. Not with this one. They did this so much better than the Tundra that 
this truly deserves a praise to them for doing such a good job on this update. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my videos. Until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.